Okay, so this is going to be a little bit of a freestyle session. So we have the Zoom chat. I cannot watch everything. So let's let's focus on chatting in the Zoom chat. And then I will be uh, doing some stuff here. So you, you can uh, watch the screen. So we will use Mentimeter for coordination. You can post questions in the Mentimeter as well. But for chatting, please use the uh, Zoom chat such that I can keep track of of everything. <laughs> With the single screen, it's going to be a bit tricky. OK, so first things first. Um, we do have um, in the lecture sections, we have some videos. And I do encourage you to watch them. Uh, so there are two videos. Uh, one is by me. It's an introduction to Rust. Uh, so I don't, I don't want to repeat myself. So I will not focus on some of the things that are covered there. And the second video is by Carl. He was our uh, additional te teaching assistant or teacher. Uh, he's our past student who went into industry and he's working and he gave some invited talks uh, last year and the previous year. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't organize him for this year, but we can watch him uh, through the video. So he had a lecture on ownership and I had the introductory lecture on um, basics of Rust. So I am reusing some of the slides, but I will not cover the whole material. The whole material was covered is covered in the in the video. So please please watch that. What we will do instead, we will focus on um, some little things that I think you we have to spend some extra attention on, and we will do some practical exercises. Okay, so let's do a little bit of a theory first. Um, so you can ask me anything. The question is, what is causing you the most problems with Haskell? So it is a little bit of a feedback to me, uh, what still needs to be covered and what we can uh, focus on. I also want to say that in this video, in the introduction to Rust, the, the first hour is about Rust, but the last 20 minutes are about monads and monad transformers and state. And this is a part which will be helpful for your assignments, especially if you're doing assignment two with Haskell, because managing state and managing uh, how the state is being processed is so much easier and nicer if you do use a state monad or a state transformers. I said the state transformers are not part of the course and there will be no exam questions about either state or state transformers. But if you do want to learn a little bit more and if you want to use them in assignments, then watch the final 20 minutes of this lecture and we can cover the, the topic in more depth a little bit more. You have to read a little bit on, on it yourself, but it's a, a gentle introduction conceptually what is there. Um, all right, so let's go back. So what is hard? How can I view the answers? Okay, so let me close that. Yeah, so the loops, <laughs> you will have loops in the Rust. So I actually hate that part. Um, I prefer the no loops concept, which is easier than having kind of loops. But anyway, yeah, so no loops is kind of a paradigm shift because you have, you're coming from C and C++ and you have to sort of start thinking about processing data in a slightly different way. But it is kind of the same in, in Rust. Rust has a lot of collection um, uh, metaphors which are kind of functionally based and then you can achieve a lot of things without loops as, as well. So I, I think this is kind of good that you're finding it hard, but it's sort of teaching you a different way of approaching problems that you traditionally were solving with loops, but you can solve without. And it's the same here. Um, so understanding all those symbols, it's a little bit, uh, it takes a little bit of a uh, 
a little bit of practice. Uh, SDL problems, yes, that was technicalities. Um, so yeah, that could be could be improved. Uh, syntax, I actually struggle with Rust syntax more. Uh, there is more rules to follow and more things to think about. Um, books, we can, if you have, if you found better books, post them into the materials and I will use them for next year. If, the, if you find a, a better, more approachable um, way of dealing with concepts. So all those things are apart from SDL <laughs> are sort of intentional. Like Haskell is quite hard in terms of concepts, but Rust is very similar. Uh, Rust is inspired by Haskell and has a lot of similar concepts. So as I said, you can achieve a lot of things in Rust without loops, uh, or you can go back to a more C, C++ traditional way of doing that. So yeah, thanks for feedback and thanks for the comments. Um, we can discuss it a little bit more. And if you have some suggestions of how things can be improved in the future, then post them into the materials or as a, as a feedback. Great. So let's move on. So uh, a second question is why do we start with C, C++, then go into Go and Haskell and Rust, and then we sort of left you uh, acquiring other languages. Why do you think we decided to choose those, this line of, of languages as a kind of foundational for you to, to learn and to study? We discussed that a little bit at the beginning, but what makes those, this family of languages kind of special? What do you think? And data engineer, if you, if you were studying bachelor of data engineer, you would start with Python, for example, and then you would move to Java. And we don't do that choice. We don't start you with Python or with Java, actually. Uh, we, we start with C and C++. So what would be a difference? What would be your difference in understanding if you started with Python and then followed with Java? That's right. So uh, low level stuff. Uh, so wh wh what is low level? One of the things which you wouldn't learn using Python or Java is memory management, for example. Uh, C and C++ introduce you to concepts of pointers. Um, and this is something absent in Python or in Java. You have references in Java, but you don't have direct access to pointers in, in any form. Um, Yes, we covering a variety of topics and variety of concepts. So you are exposed to pretty much everything that there is in programming uh, using this uh, pack of languages. Um, and C is fundamental. As we were learning uh, a little bit in the foreign function calls, uh, C is basically the uh, foundational inter change language, which glues everything together. Uh, so yeah, good answers. I think we are sort of on the same page. Okay, so a little bit of a reminder what Rust is. So Rust is heavily inspired by Haskell. Uh, it is, um, you, you control ma memory manually uh, and it is done by the compiler. It's not done by garbage collector or runtime system. It's an excellent language for embedded systems. It's excellent language for resource bound systems where you have to control all the resources and what you are doing with the memory and with the CPU. It's very suitable for real time systems and it has a very small core. So as we were explaining last time, the runtime system is almost non-existent. Uh, you control everything that is actually compiled in and 
the footprint is, is very minimalistic. So some facts about rats is statically typed. There is no garbage collector. Uh, everything related to memory management is compile time. So you control how things are done in, in terms of memory when you write your code. And then the compiler will decide everything uh, in terms of releasing memory and, and managing memory su such that uh, it is kind of a compile time memory management. C++ has a little bit both. So you do have constructs which allow you to control memory uh, via the compiler, of course, but you do have to do certain things in the runtime as well. You have to deallocate uh, memory yourself. Here you don't. So it's a manual memory management. There is no inheritance. Uh, another language that you learned with no inheritance is Golang. It's similar. Uh, and one unique thing which it heavily borrows from Haskell is that mutability is on request. Uh, mutability in Haskell is kind of non-existent. You have to fake mutable state by doing tri tricks with monads and with function. Uh, here you can pretend, uh, I mean, you don't have to pretend, you actually have the mutable uh, ability to mutate state directly, but you have to request it. By default, the all the constructs and your let uh, variables are immutable. There is one more thing, uh, which I haven't here on the list, that um, most of the collections in Rust are lazy. And the concept of laziness, you also learned from Haskell. So you don't have lazy things in C or C++. Everything is strict and everything is evaluated when you call it. Uh, but in, in Rust, you do actually have lazy collections and they are only evaluated when needed. So it's a kind of new concept that um, doesn't exist in the previous languages that you've learned. Okay, so one more question. Uh, what is systems programming? So we have two degrees. One degree is bachelor in programming, and that's you guys. Uh, we have um, web programming in the design department, and they are focusing on a front-end development heavily and with the user interactions. And then there is a data engineer who are focusing on engineering problems where they use software to solve some of the engineering problems. So what is systems programming and why we talk about it? That's right. So it is programming for the operating system. It's programming some services or some systems that may not necessarily be directly related to end users. We often do those uh, systems programming tasks for other programmers or for other systems. Uh, so it is something that sort of sits between the very low level uh, virtualization or operating systems drivers. It includes operating system uh, services, but not operating system itself usually, but it also is related to the operating system. Um, and it sits below uh, end user applications usually. Uh, of course, some systems programming involve uh, end users, but often the end user for us is actually another programmer or another engineer who will be using tooling and systems that we develop to develop more complicated things, right? So for example, we are the programmers who develop Python, right? So we build Python and then other people use Python, right? We not necessarily use it for our work. We kind of develop systems or things for others to use. So there is kind of a hierarchy uh, which is growing, including kind of web services and uh, cloud and all, all kind of intermediary things, which we, you know, comfortably fit in. Uh, traditionally, you know, there was a this distinction between backend and frontend programming. The backend became kind of more heavy because of the cloud and, and, and so on. So we sort of sit somewhere in between. In your career, you can of course migrate more towards frontend programming if you if you decide to do that, or if you are more inclined to work with the application development or with users. Or you can kind of migrate more into low levels, you know, uh, hardware as a software uh, or, or cloud services. Uh, but we kind of give you the foundations which are sort of in the middle. Uh, and then you can choose your, your future career path uh, directly, you know, where, where it will lead you. 
Uh, yep, so that's what we have discussed. Next one is about the feel of Rust. So as we have discussed in the issue tracker, there is this semicolon issue which came back. Like, you know, we had Golang this semester and, and Haskell, and we didn't need to deal with semicolons, colons, and this kind of things. But now with Rust, we have to go back to C-like. So it has a kind of a C-family-like feel. Um, and it's quite complex in terms of syntax, at, at least I think so. Um, and as we were discussing, you have to remember where you do those semicolons and colons and, and so on. Golang did excellent job by simplifying all of that uh, substantially, right? So Golang kind of says, okay, we actually don't need semicolons or colons. <clears throat> we can have a very nice um, representation of types of what is what without all those additional things. But here we kind of have that. Um, it is nice that they uh, that Rust also uses the type behind, uh, so it's a, a little bit more consistent with with Golang, and they do have complex combinators. Uh, Rust, we will not gonna learn about it, but if you're interested in uh, studying more, you can learn uh, about macros and how to use them. They are quite complicated, and again, the syntax is super complicated, but you can achieve sort of nice nice properties. Uh, similar to, to Haskell actually, using a very simple notation. And that's why we use the macros. The macros in, in Rust are recognizable by the exclamation mark. So everything that finishes with exclamation mark is a macro. That's why we use print line with a as a macro or vec as a macro because they are much more powerful than just pure normal functions. Um, Okay, so you can read more about Rust. So a little bit of a quiz from your experience so far and from programming in different languages. What do you think? Um, what do you think is the relative difficulty of those languages that are listed there, uh, with the very easy on the left and very hard on the on the right? So the, judging the languages relatively between the different languages, what would you say is the, in your kind of opinion, in your feel, uh, what was easy, what uh, what is hard, and what those languages kind of uh, map? So, Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting uh, summary. We have some kind of a dual hump. Some people think C is easier than Go, but most people think C is a little bit harder. Uh, C++ is more complicated than Golang, uh, and it kind of ranks somewhere in the middle. Then Python is and JavaScript are on the easy side, and then Haskell is heavily on the right-hand side. So it's Yep, I, I would say it's kind of consistent with my own um, feel. And if you, if you so I, I would say C and Golang are similar because of different reasons. So C is a little bit more complicated because of pointers and pointer arithmetic, which Go really simplified. So Go is a bit simpler in that respect. But Golang has kind of a functional feel and you have those closures and the functions which can be local to functions and we do with functions much more. So it, it, it is not a functional programming language, but it has constructs which allow you to use higher order functions, which we normally don't do in C. And that is more complicated than C. Um, C++, I would say also it's a little bit in the middle and oh, I would agree with you that Haskell is the hardest. And then for me, Rust sort of sits somewhere here. It's easier than than Haskell, but it's harder than all the other languages. <clears throat> That's what I personally feel that has uh, that Rust is sort of a little bit on eight. <coughs> okay, so let's rant a little bit. So we've been already ranting about Rust having a lot of constructs for loops. 
<laughs> and covering um, a lot of ground with loop constructs. We have loop, you have while, you have for, and so on and so forth. So there is a lot of keywords to remember. So it's um, you, you don't need to do that, of course. But, um, okay, we have a quiz. I don't remember the quiz. Let's see. Okay. <laughs> What's the most messed up for loops? In which language you feel the for loops are the most messed up? Obviously, that's a ranty, opinionated uh, quiz. And I have <laughs> I have my own personal bias here. So yes, I I think Rust is the most messed up for loops. For two reasons. Why, why? One reason is that it has so many constructs for achieving the same thing, which is completely unnecessary. And the second reason is this. So normal while loop is like that. So you say do stuff as long as the condition is true. And then if the condition is false, you will not do stuff at all, right? So then you have to have do stuff as the first line and then you say while conditions do stuff again so you have to repeat yourself kind of twice in two lines if you want a behavior to do stuff first time regardless of the condition and then check the condition right and in c of course we have a very nice construct which looks like this we say do do stuff while the condition is true, but the do stuff will be done for the first time, even if the condition is false, and then we will quit, right? So we do achieving what we want in a single line of code. If we were to do this, you, we have to have two lines of code, right? You agree with me. So then let's do in, in Rust, achieve, let's do in Rust without repeating yourself. How would you do that? So use the chat. Okay, I have some chat. So Oyston is suggesting that what we could do is we could have uh, we could use this. We could use this and set the condition to true. And then it will do this one, one round because it is true. And then do stuff would have to change the conditions to false depending on what the condition is, right? Um, yeah, that could probably work. Yes, that would uh, solve the, the, the problem. But what if, yeah, I guess that that might be, um, that might work. Great. So Cecilia has, I don't think you guys, uh, yeah, you see the chat, of course. So you see the chat. So Cecilia has uh, recommended one construct, which is using the loop. And that's one way of achieving that in, um, in Rust. And I think the code that uses break sort of smells a little bit. So of course, break is there to be used and uh, we, we are using break, but it always feels like, can we do without a break? Okay, so could this be rewritten such that we achieve the same thing without the break? Uh, if it can, then usually that's a preferred way, right? Uh, okay, right, so she was cheating a little bit. Um, all right, so I will reveal the, because I kind of talked about it in the in the lecture. So um, there are two, let's say, idiomatic ways of doing it in Rust, and both are terrible. Uh, so I actually would prefer the, the um, to do this with the condition being true, like as Oyston suggested, because I think even though we have to do it in two lines of code, uh, the condition has to be somehow initialized anyway, and then do stuff has to modify it because it's the, the pattern that we want, right? So the pattern is um, that 
do stuff modifies the condition. Otherwise, this loop wouldn't make sense. And then if we set the C to true, yeah, we, we kind of have two lines, but it, it kind of works. But the, um, sorry, sorry. So this is the um, idiomatic way of achieving it. And this one is the one which is which feels more C-like. Uh, it kind of feels understandable. This one is the, the interesting one because we're using this code block as an expression. And this code block as an expression returns the value. And this value is either true or false. And then the actual loop is empty. Like the actual body of the loop doesn't do anything because all the logic is done in the con in the condition in in the first part, which is the expression here. Um, no, break is not considered uh, bad, but break introduces complexity. It it is kind of like a go to statement. It in introduces additional complexity that you need to keep track of what you're breaking from. If you don't use break, then it's a little bit more. Um, easy that the complexity of the um, the code is sort of smaller and then typically it is um, it is better to prefer solutions which are less complex to solutions that are more complex um, but break is there and we often have to use break uh, especially if we have nested loops and we want to quit uh, somewhat earlier than fulfilling the the full iterations and, and so on so it is not to be avoided at all costs, but it is to be considered as a potentially introducing complexity. Same as if else statements, uh, they also introduce complexity. Can we avoid if else statements? No, we cannot, we have to use if else, but sometimes we can use if and then avoid else. Or sometimes maybe we can do something using iterators and don't have uh, if uh, statements at all. And that that is usually easier. So. It's, it's a matter of style and it matters of dealing with the complexity. Okay, so let's do some practical exercises. So um, you can watch the lecture and you can watch the rest of the kind of uh, discussions on, on Rust, but I, I hope you sort of um, got um, a gist of how Rust wo works and we will do some practical uh, exercises. So the first one is the same as Cecilia did in the, uh, in the issue tracker. Uh, which is just doing a red tangle, okay? Why, why, you know, should we just read Cecilia's code instead? Uh, is, the answer is no, because uh, if we read somebody else's code, it doesn't kind of, um, you know, our muscle memory, our things will not be internalized. So we have to do stuff ourselves. Uh, also, I recommend not using an IDE. I recommend you open a browser, uh, so if I go to Google and you and you search for Rust Playground, you're going to get to a Rust Playground and then try to do it in a plain vanilla environment such that there is no IDE, there is nobody to do code completion for you and no highlighting. I mean, there is some highlighting, but it's very bare bones. Why? Because then you sort of, uh, again, internalize some of the things of how to type and how the syntax works. So normally at work, of course, you should use IDE and you should use all the good features of the IDE. But here uh, you are kind of like pen and paper uh, situation and it actually works better educationally for you to practice, right? So reading somebody else's code is nice, but doing your own coding is better. And then what we want to do is we want to do it in the playground. So in the playground, do, do a red tangle. So uh, how would you define a struct, which is a red tangle, and how you would write a method which calculates an area. Try to do it from memory. Try not to cheat by Googling it or asking chat GPT, just try to do it yourself. Uh, and then pay attention to what you don't remember, right? So don't like, is it the syntax that is causing you a problem? Like, don't you remember whether to put comma or semicolon? Or is it like you don't remember the actual keywords, like struct keyword? Or do you don't remember where it goes? Does it go first or does it go second? So kind of pay attention to yourself, like how you're writing it um, and where will you have mistakes? Because then you will 
Remember that, and then you will not make those mistakes again. I am confused with Rust syntax all the time, so it, it's not a problem that you are not remembering something. But try not to look things up first, try to write it from memory and then try to compile it and then try to see where did you make mistakes and what is missing. And that will kind of tell you like what you need to focus on. So it's a very simple exercise, very simple kata. You're just writing a, a struct and a single method uh, or, or function, and then pay attention to choices of how you're doing it, okay? So please do it, please do it in the, um, in the playground and then copy and paste it into a chat and then we will discuss it, okay? So everybody try to do that. Try to do a very simple example of um, red stangle with height and width and how you calculating area. While you're doing it, I will uh, continue answering about... <laughs> okay, if you don't know any Rust, try to do it in a language that you know and then see how is it different. So go to the playground and basically instead of func, say fn, so func equals um, fn, and then try to do it in Golang and then try to compile it and see what the compiler tells you. Uh, about the break, so uh, I'm still ranting about how to use or not use break. So there is a concept of cyclomatic complexity. And that's a measure of how complex your function is. And then uh, break contributes to that co cyclomatic complexity. And um, if you use linters, for example, if you use Golang uh, CI lint, it has a, um, a linter, which is called GoCycle. And then you can actually calculate um, for your Golang code, what is the cyclomatic complexity of your functions? And then you can set uh, what is the limit. And the, I think the default limit is something like uh, 36. And then if you exceed the 36 limit, the Golang linter will complain, will say this function is too complex. Um, so using, um, using break increases that count. Using if statements increases that count. Using switch statements increases that count, but less than the if statements and so on. So you, you're gonna sort of get a feel of how complex your functions become by using different little constructs. And break is one of those contributing constructs. Does it mean we not use break? Of course not, we use break. Does it mean we don't use if statements? Yes, we use if statements. But if you can avoid nesting them multiple times, like for example, a third level of nesting if statement is so expensive in complexity that it blows up your complexity count kind of immediately. So, um, you know, those are just guidelines like avoid, avoid break, uh, nested if statements, uh, especially deep nested, deep nested, um, prefer, prefer switch over if, and so on. So there are kind of rules related to cyclomatic complexity that you can kind of follow. All right, we have some examples. So let's uh, let's have a discussion. So let's pick the first one first. So we have the first one. Okay. So let's let me copy that, and we kind of talk about it. So each of you did something, uh, and let's see. Okay, so for example, we have the first one and the second one. So I will just separate them for just code review. Okay, so we have two. Um, Two completely different uh, choices uh, made. I think that's a good. 
uh, that's a good one. Although I would like to have them. Um, so there is one more, which I will copy here as well. So there is one more, which is more like this. So let's compare the last one. So the last one has uh, a definition of red stango and implementation. And then in the main, we doing something with it. The first one has a main and the definition of red stango and the implementation inside the main. And then we kind of currently not doing anything with it, right? But we could we could uh, say some some code using that stango. Okay, so what do you think should uh, should we do um, between for, for the task? Should we extract that outside main? Or should we keep that in main? And when to do what? Should that be local to main, our declarations, or should they be outside of main? That's that's a choice, right? We already making some choices. When to use, when to use, do what? So one suggestion is it should be outside. It should be outside, okay. Any alternative views? So I think, yeah, it, it should be outside of main, but inside the module. Exactly. So Paul has a very good point. What if we only use those structures in our main? Then why should we have it outside? Then we should have it inside, right? So if something is only used in that one single function and not used anywhere else, then it shouldn't be outside. Then it should be inside that function. And that's the, the rule. The rule of thumb is you should have stuff enclosed in a context, which is the minimum con usable context that it has to be in. So if those structures are used by other functions, then they have to be outside and within the module. If those if we have to use those functions outside of the module, then it ha they have to be in the module and declared as pub and then exposed externally. But if something is used only in one single function, then it should only be here, right? However, uh, I have been reviewing the submission system code. The submission system code is written in Golang. And there are some functions like this. Okay, so imagine that there is a function F1 and there is a function F2. And the fun the function F1 and F2 have stuff like this. Okay. They are repeating the declaration of Redstangle. It's local to F2, but this is exactly the same as this. And that's a big no-no. You should never do that. You should never repeat the same type in two functions if it's exactly the same type, that it definitely has to be outside of those two functions. If you have to copy and paste code, then that's a, a big smell, okay? That should never happen. So in our case, I would say, yeah, I mean, for this very simple exercise, having everything in main is probably okay, but there is a second argument. The second argument is now our main has kind of a lot of uh, stuff already in it. Right, uh, the complexity of main is growing because we are kind of keeping those things inside here. So even if we and struck this small s, even if we uh, try to contextualize it kind of in the sim smallest context possible, we kind of need to take into account the readability and kind of a mental load on somebody reading our code, and sometimes keeping that outside, even if it's only used in main, is probably a good idea, right? Because if I'm reading stuff like this, um, 
then I say, okay, main is doing some things with those things. And then I don't need to be kind of contextualizing the complexity of main. Like my main now is very simple because I only focusing on this. And then this is kind of a background stuff that I need to think about when I'm reading the, the type. But it's a, a little bit of a matter of style. So in case we only use those two things in main, we could have them in here, but I would still agree with other people saying, yeah, probably it's better to, to have them outside. Okay, second choice. Should we have our rectangle struct as named fields or should we have it as a tuple? What do you think? Is it better to have it as a tuple or is it better to have it as a named struct where you can refer to the actual fields? Yep. So uh, people are suggesting that uh, naming things, it's a little bit easier because it's easier to understand what they are for and how they should be used. Uh, if we have things unnamed, of course it will work, but like what, which, what is, what is, uh, what is what? I assume this one is width and this one is height, but what if it is the other way around? And sometimes uh, with more complex things, you don't know if it's, uh, because sometimes when we deal with coordinates, you can have width and height, of course, but sometimes you can have X and Y as a point. And then if you don't have it named, it's a little bit unclear. Do you mean width or do you mean X? Um, right. In, in this case, because we only have two, uh, it cannot be a point because then it wouldn't be a rectangle. So it kind of, you can kind of guess it has to be this, but you have to be guessing. It, it, it introduces a little bit of a mental load, right? So I would say, yep, uh, go with this. Internally, uh, the compilers will kind of optimize it that it there is actually no difference if you're using this or this in terms of complexity of the generated code. It will be pretty much the same. Um, but... I would probably go with this because of the readability and because of the easy, e e easier maintenance, okay? But general rules is that if you have something that is obvious, like uh, four obvious things, um, up to two. So if it's just one thing or two things, uh, you stop all is okay. So you uh, using using tuple is okay. So I would say yeah that that code is okay, but I would give slight preference to this one. Both are okay. Uh, if this grow <laughs> grows, if you have like you know, uh, if you have four things, then th this code is not okay anymore. I mean because then like okay probably I have x and y and width and height or maybe I have a uh, um, like, you know, either I have, because I don't know, like, for example, with this, I don't know if I have X and Y and like X1, Y1, because I, you have multiple um, interpretations of this. It could be like this and X2, Y2, or it could be like X1, Y1 and height and width or width and height, right? Um, so then it's confusing, like that definitely this is not uh, correct, but with two, it's acceptable. But again, it's still a little bit easier to deal with this. Okay, should you name them height and width or should you name them H and W? Longer names, more descriptive names, or very short names? Uh, 
again, it's a matter of style. So Arnold is suggesting height and width for the re reasons of readability and uh, ease of maintenance. Um, so again, the rules are, if it's obvious, if it is obvious, always prefer shorter than longer, right? So if something is obvious, then you can prefer shorter names. Is H and W obvious? Yeah, borderline. I would say both are acceptable. I would probably go with height and width, but both are fine uh, in this case. It's almost obvious that H means height and W means width. I would have a small preference to height and uh, width. But if I see a code with H and W, I would say, yeah, that's probably fine. If I see code with X and Y for its tangle, I would be totally confused. Like, oh, what's that, right? Then there is a completely uh, wrong, completely wrong. If I say the width of the red tangle, that's completely wrong as well. It's like way, way too much typing, right? It's sort of a uh, Java style naming conventions, very bad. Uh, go with width and height. Okay, so a lot of choices. I mean, it's such a trivial thing, but we already talked for like, you know, 10 minutes about different choices. Okay, what should the type be? Should the type be unsigned integers? Integers with negative values? Can you have a negative width or negative height? Should you use floats? If you're using floats, which one? F 32 or F 64? What should the type be? I mean, here we have integer signed. I would be like, okay, why the width and height is negative? So is the choice of an integer good choice here? Again, there are no very clear answers because it depends. It depends is the answer, right? It depends what you want, what you're doing. Uh, it depends what you need it for. Um, so probably F64 is probably the the usual default, right? So width and height with um, F F64 would be probably the normal default, but um, but what if we deal with pixels? Then if we deal with pixels, I would probably say un unsigned 32 is the uh, a reasonable default, right? Because then it communicates, yeah, we're dealing with pixels. Okay. That that's correct. So uh, there is a comment in the chat about naming conven conventions and use the snake snake conventions. So we use um, we use name something and so on. So we delimit things like this. So we say name for something in Golang and in Haskell, we would say name for something. And if it's a type, we would in, in Golang and um, Haskell, we'd say capital N for making it public or making it a type. Here, uh, here we kind of are enforcing this and the compiler will complain if you don't follow the snake conventions. Yeah, exactly. So as Cecilia is saying, compiler is complaining if you don't follow the snake. Okay, so um, the types are important. If you use unsigned 32, I would guess, I would guess immediately that you're talking, that we're talking pixels, okay? But what if you said with is a float? 
64. Then I would guess, maybe wrongly, that width is from zero to one. And it's a kind of, um, you know, open GL style width that one is the full width and like half is half of the width. Um, because I would think that's not about pixels. I would think that's about some kind of a relative conversions to pixels, which we have to do in our pipeline. And then that would be something that is kind of uh, from zero to one. If, yep, uh, if there are units, then uh, that probably needs to be in the comment, right? So if you're doing U32, pixels is probably the default, you probably should tell it in the comments anyway, right? So you probably, whatever you did decided, you probably should explain what it is and what are the units. So as Oyston is saying, what are the units? And that should be in the comment. All right, so we got there. Um, there was one extra thing that was um, interesting. Let me scroll which was this one. So somebody did, uh, somebody did, whoops, um, derive debug. What is derive debug doing? What is deadline doing? So in our case, it's pixels. And then that would be unsigned. Uh, how much you need to comment? Uh, so that's a good question. You basically need to comment enough that it's obvious. So if you use U32 and you didn't say it's pixels, then I would assume it's pixels. If you say F64, that would be an, like, um, uh, what other units? Uh, everybody would be kind of wondering. What is this? Is, does it go from zero to one or does it go from zero to infinity? What the negative with means? Because you know, with flows we have negative, like there is a lot of questions. So all those questions would have to be in the comments. So answers to all questions should be in the comments. So if there is any question and it's not answered in the comment, then the comment is not sufficient. So the comment needs to explain exactly what, what is it and what is it for. Um, so if you use F64, there is more to say because you have to explain what the negative mean, what the numbers mean. If you say unsigned, then of course there are no negatives. So the only thing is what are the units? Are the unit pixels or are, are the units something else? Okay, so derive allows you to print it and it allows you to print it in a form like a print line explanation mark. And then you say this, this thing, right? So if I say I have a red stangle, let rect equals red stangle with size. Then and height is 20, then it will work, right? Yeah, so it allows us to write it in the standard console into standard errors because if we didn't do that, so let me delete that, let us test this. Let's write the un units are pixels. So that's sufficient comment <laughs> because there is no negative and it's clear, obvious what, what that struct is doing. Okay. Um, 
do we need a comment for the okay so first i would say like this i would not double nest this so i would just do this Well, where is my oh come on yep all right so do we need comment here do we need comment for this function i would say no we don't need a comment for this function because this function is obvious this function is obvious what it takes, and this function is obvious what it returns. Uh, there is no need for a comment. So let's try it. OK, syntax errors. So the struct fields are separated by comma, not by semicolon. And then the last one is optional. You can have it, you don't have it, uh, I think. And then, of course, in the implementation, we forgot self. So that's our typo. So we're fixing that. And then, So the fields are never read. So this is a warning that we have some declared something, but we never really use it. Uh, that's fine. And then uh... yeah, so uh, area is also that code. And then it prints a uh, finally we get what we want. Um, we uh we can so there is a question should whether we forgot about the ampersand where like uh the question is is there ampersand you know missing yeah we're gonna talk about it in a moment so let me see is is that still readable you can still read the screen i think so Okay, so that code, should we say ignore that code? We can have, we can have uh, ignore something like this, that code. I think that's the correct syntax. Of Obviously I can be wrong. Uh, I may need to Google that. Yeah, you're right. That's allowed, not ignore. Okay, let's go. Allow, allow that code. Uh, yeah, anyway, so we still like it doesn't um uh, because this applies to the struct and now we have two dead code variables which are never used and then I would probably have to copy that um to our implementation I guess here Should you use that? Should you remove all the dead code warnings? I would say no. Uh, so now we removed all the dead code warnings and we have the printout, but you don't know what you don't use. And then code with stuff that you don't use is a smelly code. So you should be aware. Um, obviously it's nicer to see no warnings, but um, I think you should uh, not use that. And you should let yourself see all the stuff that is declared, but not currently used. 
Okay, so then about ampersand. Um, we are currently passing area to self. I, I mean the self to the area. So what will happen if we try to do what Cecilia was trying to do? So we have, um, let's say, um, let area equals uh, rect area. And then we print the rect and the area. What's going to happen? Our rect has the area. OK, let's see what happens. Now we should not have warnings about not used code because we calling area and area is using height and width. So the unused unused code warnings are gone. Okay. But we have the borrow checker problems. The borrow checker is saying, oh, no, naughty Marius, you're doing something that you're not supposed to do. So what is happening here? Why I'm doing something that I'm not supposed to do? Perfect, Cecilia. Uh, would that code work in C or C++? If I have, if I declare a struct and I have a function, okay, so one more choice. Uh, we, we have one more choice to discuss. I can implement area like this, or I can implement area. Um, so, and it returns you 32. And then I would say rec width times rec height. Okay, should we have area implementation like this or like this? What do you prefer and why? That's a choice. Like we chosen this one, but in Cecilia's code, which she tried before, she chose or the book chose this one. Okay. What's what should we prefer? What is better? Why we should use this over this? Any suggestions? <laughs> yep, so uh, there is a suggestion su uh, suggesting <laughs> that this one is preferred because it communicates the intent of the area function more clearly, that this area function is associated with rectangles and it kind of doesn't work with anything else. Uh, and I would agree. I would prefer that um, I would prefer that solution over this one. I would choose the second one in situations where we have more um, more polymorphic behaviors. And then the area is associated with multiple things and we kind of using it for multiple times, types. Then I would probably say, yeah, then maybe the functional approach, this functional approach is better. I would also use the second approach for functions. So if I have a fun function that transforms one type into another type or returns the same type. So let's angle. Then uh, the functions which do some transformations, uh, again, you can express them as implementations for the 
think that they are transforming, but if they are transforming multiple things, but the function name is kind of the same, then the functional approach, this this kind of de defining the function is is better, uh, communicates the, the intent association, mental association a little bit better. But it is noticeably a matter of style. They are kind of equivalent and it depends what you're doing and what you're trying to communicate, you will pick one over the other, right? So in our case, I would say this is probably, sorry, it's probably a better way of dealing with this. So I, I would say, let's go with that. Okay, so then we have the ampersand thing. Uh, this doesn't work because we forgot something. We forgot that um, Rust has a borrow checker. And borrow checker is a very, uh, very good friend who will make sure you do memory management correctly. So if we did this code in C uh, and we had a function, we don't have this type of implementations in struct, although if we called it a class, then we could do this type of implementation of area inside the Restango class, correct? Um, but imagine that you did that in, um, Imagine that you did that in C and then you have a function in C area that you kind of defined here. And then you're doing this code. Would that code work in C, uh, C++ or C? Yes or no, simple answer. So imagine that we have a struct like this in C++ or C, and then we have a function which calculates which is exactly like this, returns the unsigned integer. And then we instantiating here a red stangle and we calling the area on that red stangle. And then we printing those two things. Would that work? Yes, it would work, exactly. So that code would work in C or C++ because C and C++, they don't have a borrow checker. But in Rust, there is a borrow checker and it keeps track of who owns a particular you know, uh, allocation. And in here, the rect variable owns this, this struct. Is that struct on the heap or is that struct on the stack? Oh, come on, just guess. If you don't know, just guess. Heap or stack? Stack, of course. This red, uh, this red, uh, this stack struct red stangle is on the stack, and the rect variable has a reference to that to that stack allocation. And then this rect rect reference is being passed to the area function, and the area function is now the owner of that rect because this, this function uses the self parameter, which is this rect. So it consumed the ownership of, the, of this rect stack allocation. And then here we have just the number, which is the calculated area. So what happened? Um, so at this point, what happened to rect? and to the uh, red stangle struct. What happened to the rect? So, so first, what happened? What happened to the red stangle struct? Yeah, the the rec, the red stangle struct ha, has been borrowed by the uh, by the function by the method area, but to the struct itself to to this not not to rect but to this what happened? Yeah, he got taken by area and and then what? So here in this line, it got happened taken by the area. 
So in this line here, in this line here, what happens? Like what? What is what is that 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 struct? Well, it actually because it's on the stack. Remember, this one is on the stack. Allocation on the stack. So in this moment, nothing happened. Okay, nothing happened to that um, to that stack allocated red rectangle. It's still there. It still sits there. Nothing happened. Can you access it? No, you cannot access it. Exactly. No. Why? Because rect, the handle that we had, this rect variable got invalidated. Uh, the compiler says, okay, I actually invalidated this variable. This variable is not in scope anymore. You, you, you cannot use it. So in this line here, after, after this line, the rect is not usable. You nobody can touch it. So we cannot access this rec rect anymore. If this rect was allocated on the heap, so let's do a mental um, changeover and let's allocate it on the heap. So let's say let rect is on the heap. And then how are we gonna do that? Well, there is this box concept, right? And we say box new. So that would be allocated on the heap. And we have a reference to the heap allocation to the struct, which is on the um, yeah, that's right. So where if we if we did that, and if the area used the um, the red stangle from the heap, then this would be dropped. So the actual allocation of red stangle would like at the end of area because it consumed the the heap allocated the red stangle, then the area would say, okay, we're dropping it. So <clears throat> here, uh, instead of nothing happened, what would be is um, red stangle on the heap got deallocated. And then the same story, which is this variable would be invalidated and you cannot use it anymore. Okay. So all right, so let's go back. Let's go back here, and then we have to fix our problem. So we're not allocating on the heap. We're allocating on the stack. And then we know that this invalidates it, so we need to fix it. So how are we going to fix it? Well, we basically pass a reference. So instead of passing the ownership to this allocated struct, we want to pass a reference to that struct in, in this method. So we're going to do this. And if we do that, let's see if that fixes our problem. It does. It says, well, you have this red stangle, which we accessing the rect. We can access rect because the area is not taking ownership of the rec of this red stangle. It's taking a reference. But we call it the same way, right? When it was taking ownership of rect, or if it was taking the just the reference, the method call is exactly the same. So internally, Rust is doing a trick, a trick for us because if area takes a reference, then the compiler passes passes the reference to rect into 
into the area function, right? But if area takes an ownership, then, then the area call is like this. It, it's, it's simulated like this, of course, right? Because the actual call is exactly the same. And it is, again, a little bit confusing, right? If I'm reading this code, if I'm reading this code, I don't know if area takes ownership of rect or if area takes a reference to rect, right? I don't see it. Like in the code, you don't see it. So then the compiler tells you, right? <laughs> if the area takes ownership and you're doing something with this rect afterwards, the compiler will complain. But if the area doesn't take the ownership, it takes a reference, the compiler will not complain, right? So if we had, so if we had this implementation, if I say function area takes a rect, which is a red angle, blah, 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 right? I, I don't want to implement it, but here, if I said area rect, or area rect, that would be verbose, right? If area takes ownership, I would have to call this. If I try to call this, the compiler will say that that's a compiler error. You cannot pass a reference to something that expects uh, to take the ownership. And if I said I am passing a reference to a red stangle, uh, then if I try to do this, the compiler would complain, says, no, you cannot pass the you know the actual rect you have to pass a reference to rect right so with this implementation uh the call is explicit and it's it's clear what is happening with this implementation the call is not explicit because it is hidden there, there, there is in, internally rust is doing a little bit of a trickery for us and it depends what this implementation is. So of course, if you wrote it yourself, you know that you're passing it by reference. But if this is implemented in some library and you're just calling that library function like this, you actually don't know. Is the library implemented this or this? And then the compiler will tell you, right? So it, yeah, that is some mental load to read somebody else's code because you kind of need to know what, what is happening. So Cecilia is saying, when you pass something to a function using the ampersand, the function is not borrowing the value. Instead, it's taking the, um, so it is, so, so uh, having a reference means you have access to all the struct, but you're not taking ownership of that struct itself. The ownership is still within the rect. Um, so you have access, like with this implementation, we have access to hide and width, but we're not taking the ownership of the red stangle that has been passed to us. So that, that's a good explanation. So then uh, she's wondering about the print line exclamation mark. Um, does the print line takes references by default? That's what the documentation says and that's what happens. So the print line is a macro which converts all those um, variables to references and tries to take them read only as references. Uh, so read only references, references, correct. That's right. So she also played with the debugger, um, dbg exclamation mark, and that takes ownership. So again, it depends on the macro. Um, you will not know until you try and the compiler will tell you. Um, so in this case, everything works. We're not taking ownership and you can, you can access to rect is intact. It's the same as it was. So everything is perfect. Okay, so even the simple rectangle thing turned out to be quite educational because there is a lot of things happening and there is a lot of choices that you're making. So all those choices matter and you have to be aware of the choices you're making and the, the way the whole thing works. All right, so let me 
we have 10 minutes left, so we're not gonna run through the rest of the of the things, but let's do one more. So let's do the red stangle um, with the heap. So we have the ampersand, and funny enough, uh, the ampersand symbol is kind of exactly the same as the star symbol in Golang, right? So in Golang, if we converted all of this to Golang, we would basically be using the star instead of ampersand most of the time for declaration of types and for passing things around and, and so on. You only would use ampersand for, uh, in this case, for referring to the, the reference to rect. So the reference, um, so in Golang star in here, ampersand. And ampersand means uh, reference. And in Golang, that means star uh, means in Go pointer or reference type. And then ampersand is for reference. So it's a little bit confusing and Rust doesn't use the star for anything. Rust is using ampersand for the declaration of types. So you will say my area function takes a reference to rect. Same if you have function area that takes a reference to red stangle, right? Uh, 32. In Golang, you would say star here. You would say area function takes a reference to red stangle, which they call sometimes pointer. There is a terminology confusion, right? What is reference? What is pointer? All right, we, we have eight minutes left, so I will tell you very quickly, generally, uh, they are a little bit different. Um, so pointers point to memory uh, allocated stuff. So pointers is a, kind of like a handle to a memory location. Reference is the handle to something, to a variable that has access to something else. So references usually mean they, they are kind of a two variables to something that you kind of have in your in your source code where the pointer is something that lives in memory. Of course, you can have a reference to something that is a pointer to something that is in memory. So you can kind of have a chain, but usually what, when we say reference, oh, where is the playground? So usually when we say a reference, we mean to a variable, right? So here we say, area takes a reference to that variable, which is pointing to that allocated on the stack memory location. Is that a pointer? No, it's not a pointer, but you could think it is kind of like a, it, it owns this, this variable owns this red stangle, right? And this red stangle sits on the stack. We don't talk about memory here because we pretend that this red stangle, is, like this rect is that red stangle. Um, and then we say, this is a reference. If we said, I want a pointer, that would be a kind of a memory location where this thing actually sits. And here we don't care, right? Uh, in this code, we don't care where this sits because we don't operate on the pointers or on the memory at all. We will when we start doing the heap stuff because then we will have this you know, double referencing thing. So in the remaining six minutes, try to rewrite um, okay, so we did the demo only using a stack, right? So that's what we did. Um, and then try to do things on the heap. So try to keep the, uh, we have the same types. We have the structs and the method. We don't have this one. And now in our main, uh, we don't want to be doing anything on the stack. We want to only be doing stuff on the heap. Of course, it's impossible because you have to have some variables here. So you will have to have some variables that you use, which are stag allocated, but at least the red, red stangles, all the red stangles should be on the heap. You should not have any red stangles on the stack. So how would you do that? Yeah. 
yes, we have to use a box. So can someone write, uh, don't write, don't repeat the code which we have above, just write the, the two lines of code or some lines of code that we need to be able to do this. So what we want to do is we want to print our rect and we want to print the area uh, such that it works and such that the red stand goes on the heap. Done. Yep. Perfect. So we have we have a suggestion. Why not everything got copied? Copy. Okay. Uh, we need a semicolon at the end. Uh, we need to say. New. Do we need a mutable to, to achieve what we want? Do we need a mutable rect? No. All right. So then we have to calculate area. Rect area. Is this going to work? Will this work? Will this code compile? All right, there is only one way to discover by compiling it and letting the compiler tell us. So we have a type problem here uh, because rect is not of the rectangle type, it's of the box rectangle type. So let's tell, let's um, try inferring the type automatically. It works indeed. So uh, just to just to again a style. Uh, if you have code like this, an IDE will write box that stango here for you. And if you have this, it will say you thirty two for you, right? You will not actually have that in your source code. The IDE will be adding that automatically. Should you add it by hand here? And generally the answer is no. Um, so generally, if the compiler can work out exactly what you mean and the type is obvious, then you should prefer shorter solutions to longer ones. Um, so you probably should not have that in here. Uh, but it has to be obvious that rect is a box of rectangle, right? And in this line of code, it is. And as I'm saying, IDE would kind of fill up that those types for you. So you actually would see the type directly in the IDE, but the source code would be cleaner. The source code would be shorter. Why do you prefer shorter source code than longer source code? Well, obvious reasons, like there is less to type, less to read, uh, less to maintain, less possibilities of typos, less possibilities of bugs and so on and so forth. However, having said that, there is a, a counter argument because in C++ you can use auto. You can use auto my variable V and have something there, like here, some, some stuff. And the use of auto in the C++ community is a little bit controversial. Uh, some people say, well, auto is evil because you actually don't know what V type is if you keep doing autos and it's kind of difficult. And I think that relates to this kind of autofill by the IDEs. If the Audi, uh, IDE could fill up the type for you and you could see the type, what type is it uh, automatically by the IDE, then there is nothing wrong with using auto. Um, 
But as I'm saying, like it's a little bit more controversial in C++. In other languages, usually we avoid type annotations if, if they are unnecessary. You would only put them if you really want to enforce a specific type, right? So if you don't uh, if you don't have the semicolon, so compiler complains if semicolon is missing after box new. So if we have a missing semicolon and if we try to comp compile, then it will complain. Um, okay, one more time. Because this is a statement and the statements in, in Rust have to be delimited by semicolons. So this semicolon here is not optional. There are some situations where semicolon is optional, but this is not one of them. This is a, a situation where the semicolon is actually not, not optional. Um, yeah. All right, so we run out of time, uh, but I I have written a couple of uh, more examples. So there is a student exactly the same uh, with the set H. This time we kind of doing the same as with the red stangle using the heap and uh, being aware of everything and doing everything from memory. So that should be easy. And then we have vectors. So also play with that. So there, is, there are two functions that I hoped we gonna do today, but we ran out of time. We can probably review them on Monday. So one is count D. It's a function which takes the vectors of integers and count how many times the first integer appears in that list. And there is uh, another one, there are another two. So yeah, that one is easy. Uh, candies, counting how many candies we have to give to children. And that's the Rust function that you need to write. And there is one more, which is, uh, sorry. There is one more of removing items from lists. So we pass kind of a remove items and we give it to vectors and we want to get a final vector, which is like with this. So those are quite simple. I actually take uh, some of them from the Cold Wars. Uh, and what we will do is on Monday, like, so think about them. And then on Monday, we will review the code, okay? Because doing them kind of will teach us a little bit more about, about Rust and how to use vectors. So unfortunately, we ran, ran out of time today, uh, but uh, we can re redo those practical things on Monday. <laughs> yeah, I, I told him to be easy on you guys, so uh, should be should be fine. Okay, so that's all for today. Um, do those uh, small uh, katas uh, or small exercises at home uh, and try to do them in the playground. Don't use IDE. All, all of them are super simple and do them with the IDE and uh, without IDE and with the compiler only. And that will kind of help you to memorize a lot of things because IDEs are helpful and obviously you should use them, but for this kind of a training and for those um, memory exercises, just do them in the um, in the playground. Okay, good luck. If you are keen, you can do those exercises in Haskell as well, uh, because I actually like them in Haskell <laughs> quite quite more. So on on Monday we we will compare how they uh, look like. I will do them in Haskell. So if nobody else does them in Haskell, I we will compare our my my own. Okay, thanks. That's it. Thank you very much.